asked her, how long was it before you started to see a difference? She said, not long really. She said, in about 15 months. And they all looked. And they said, but how did you keep on it for so long? And she said, well, what else was I gonna do? And then they said, well, what has your doctor said? And she looked at them and she said, but I haven't got a doctor. <laughs> and it was so honest. And it was such a testimony to the, to the, the fact that if you, you can change the environment in the body and then the body will do what it knows best, which is to heal itself. So what you're doing as a patient or as a practitioner is just providing those conditions for the body to do it for itself. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, the therapy doesn't work. That's when you're therapy centric, mm -hmm. if you're patient centric. What you're saying is, can my body respond to this therapy? How do I bring my body to a point where it can respond? So I always say that the outcome isn't dependent on the treatment. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. On today's show, I have Catherine Alexander here to share with you so much information about the Gerson Therapy, her Health Commons Ready Reckoner program, and so much more about how you can use food as medicine to reverse your chronic diseases, including cancer. Catherine has so much experience in this field. Now, Catherine and I go back a long way. For the last 13 years since I've learned about the Gerson therapy, I refer my clients to Catherine first so that she can actually prescribe a treatment plan for treating my client's cancer or chronic disease. Now from there, those clients come back to me and then I teach them how to implement the protocol, everything around the science and the art of using food as medicine, the rationale for it, how to set up their day and their life in their kitchen and their home while doing the program and doing the Gerson therapy how to shop for their food and get food at discounted prices through your local grocery stores and so much more. Everything from the cooking, the cleaning, the liver detoxification, and also just around mindset. When you're changing your lifestyle and you are engaging in any type of treatment plan for a disease or anything that you're doing in life that requires change, it's really important that you understand how mindset plays a massive, massive role in your success as well. So that's the, how Catherine and I have been working together over the last 13 years, and it is such a pleasure to have her on the show today. Now, a little bit more about Catherine. Catherine has worked in the field of detoxification and nutritional healing for over 35 years. And through her work with her cancer patients, she, which who choose the Gerson therapy, that's what she chooses to use as a foundational treatment. Well, she has been able to witness firsthand the role of specific dietary protocols in the healing. So what I mean by healing is the actual reversal of their chronic disease, which can include their cancers as well. Catherine has lectured internationally. She's also the author of several publications and amazing videos. She runs courses, works with government. She also trains physicians and other healthcare workers and members of the public um, and public health professionals to self-manage their own healing programs as well. Now, you definitely need to get her your hands on her book, Nutritional Healing, because it is a must-have for everybody out there. It is loaded with the science, but it's so well-written in a way that whether you're a health professional or whether you, know, you hated science in school, you are going to love how this book really spells out why you need to turn to food as medicine, plant-based whole food as medicine. And it explains the science, the rationale, everything, amazing diagrams and more. Not only that, but it actually has the schedules that you can follow for your particular illness. Now get your hands on that book for sure, because it is the Bible of the nutritional healer of the future. Catherine is also an internationally acknowledged thought leader in patient self 
advocacy. And this is what is so important. This is why I love having Catherine on the show today, because not very many people focus on patient self-advocacy. So that means where you as the patient, take your health into your own hands. You become a key decision maker. You know the questions to ask. You know the odds and the probability of the outcome of your treatment and so much more. And this is what is going to get you success in reversing your chronic disease. So her program that she has, which we're going to talk about on the show, is called the Health Commons Ready Reckoner. An amazing program. The basics program is only 145 or 155 Australian dollars. So I encourage you to sign up for that. The details are in the show notes. And this follows four years of grounded research that she has been doing, working alongside government. This is all funded and sponsored by government to really understand how patient self-advocacy plays a massive role in the reversal of your disease. So you're going to be learning everything through her, which she'll go into detail in this program. So before we jump into the podcast, I'm going to share some of the developments on our side here at Green Mustache Richer Health, Richer Health Retreat Center, and our newest program, our 22 million strong tour and campaign. So many of you might already know that I'm going to be running across Canada and cycling across Canada for a total of 7,120 kilometers. And I'm doing this to work with Indigenous communities, Black communities, and remote communities, as well as physicians and youth to help everyone remember that food is medicine and that for centuries and for millennia, we have been using food as medicine to keep ourselves disease free. Unfortunately, over the last 100 to 415 years, we've kind of hit a speed bump or a road bump or barrier and where we've forgotten that our food is medicine. So the work I'm doing is part of my PhD research where we'll also be gathering in communities around dinners, potlucks, eating together, where we uncover the barriers to healthy eating, the barriers to access to food, the barriers to healthy lifestyles. And so with that knowledge, what we hope to do is be able to go back into the communities that we work with and actually provide not provide, but actually be able to offer up the resources needed to overcome these barriers that are identified as part of this 22 million strong tour. So if you want to get involved, if you want to run with me, if you want to ride with me, if you want to just support the campaign or become a sponsor or a partner, or just donate and let me know that you support the work that we are doing to really crush this chronic disease epidemic that's upon us, then please head over to our fundraiser campaign. The details are in the links below and donate or let us know that you'd love to sponsor or partner with us. As well, another thing that we've done on our end is we've relaunched our Richer Health Retreat Center, our new website, where we are offering up group retreats and private retreats, COVID-friendly style, so you don't have to worry there, so that you can really just dive in and get your hands dirty dirty clean as you learn how to use food as medicine, how to detoxify your liver and how to implement the Gerson therapy and our Eat Real to Heal program so that you can reverse your chronic diseases, which include cancer and diabetes and heart disease and infertility and so much more. You can reverse these diseases. All of these diseases are reversible, except for a tiny, tiny, tiny few, which are truly genetic diseases. But for the most part, 90 to 95% of these illnesses are are lifestyle diseases caused by the way you live, the what, what you eat, what you drink, what you put into your body, the toxins that you're exposed to. And so don't let anybody out there tell you that you're going to have to be on meds for the rest of your life or that you have to succumb to ongoing surgeries and that you're just going to have to live in chronic pain for the rest of your life because of these illnesses. Most of them can be reversed and we are here to show you exactly how to do that. So let's jump into this podcast with Catherine Alexander. So excited to have you here today and thank you for listening. 
Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. On our show today, I have a wonderful human on the planet and someone that I call a dear friend because we've been connected for the last 12 years because of the Gerson therapy. We'll get into those stories soon, but welcome to the show, Catherine Alexander. Thank you. So Catherine, um, just to give the audience a little bit of a background, I'll just, you know, let you know that I met Catherine through, um, well, first of all, through the Gerson therapy. So I had gone down to San Diego to train with Charlotte Gerson and become a home setup trainer. And while I was there, Charlotte Gerson only had the most amazing things to say about you, Catherine. And she said, you need to read her book um, and nutritional healing. And then of course, I, when I looked you up, I saw that you had a plethora of amazing resources for people to learn all about how diet affects your health and really about also how diet can reverse disease. So that was my first introduction to you. It's been a long time. It has, it has. And it's so nice to actually be able to, this is the first time we've actually spoken face to face. Yes. So this is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, this is so great. Yeah, because over the years, um, you know, I look at you, Catherine, as being a mentor, for sure, because you've been in this field for how long now? Has it been 30 years or more? It's been about 33, 34 years. Wow. And how did you get into this world? Let's go back. Um, because not a lot of people around the world, like definitely thousands of people know about the Gerson therapy. Um, they know about using food as a medicine, but it's still not mainstream the way I think you and I would love for it to be mainstream. So how did you get into this 35 years ago? And what did that look like? Okay, well, <clears throat> My journey began uh, probably when my son was about five years old and he was very hyperactive. But we didn't have that sort of label at the time. It was really being a bad mother. That was the label. So I started to do my research and we started to cut all the food additives out of the diet. And we noticed that there were massive changes. So then I decided that I was going to go and do a little bit of research on nutrition. And I looked around for colleges where I could go and train. And there was one college that really stood out for me, which was a a college of dietary healing or dietary therapy in the UK. It was a year course and it was actually based on the work of Dr. Gerson. So it was on detoxification and what spoke to me was that it was a way that I could actually help people restore their own resilience and become product and treatment free. So I have never actually moved one millimeter away from that. I am not a product centric girl. I am a patient centric girl. And my goal or in um, my desire in my practice is to bring people back to the place where their bodies can work for themselves and heal themselves. So I picked that particular course. And then when I started practicing, um, the course was still product heavy. You know, we were still using loads of magnesium, loads of B6. And I was thinking to myself, this isn't really doing it for me. Mm -hmm. So I started to research and looked further at Gerson therapy and the Gerson Institute had just started to train practitioners. So I contacted them and because I was just sort of a naturopath, I wasn't a doctor, it had to go to board level and I think Charlotte stepped in and said, oh, you know, let her come. (laughs) So I went and I did the training And I was probably the only practitioner at that time that bothered to take patients on after the training because it is a very um, work-intensive process to take Mm -hmm. patients on. And then I wrote to the Institute and I said, you know, your training could be a lot better. And they contacted me and we started tic-tacking and then they invited me to have a place on the board And I became a director for, you know, doing the training. 
And that was when I wrote the first training manual and, and became a trainer for them. So that was my story. And I love this story because this morning I woke up um, thinking about a dragonfly and I'll just quickly walk you through the story uh, just for listeners can see how one moment in life can really change the whole course of your life because it's true you haven't deviated from that initial training from the sense that you know our diet can restore our health it has the ability to reverse disease um, our diet has the ability to build resilience so that you can live medication free and I love the word that you use product free I know you're in Australia so maybe that's a more common term out there but you know, we might refer to it as supplement or any other kind of, you know, additive to, to the diet. But I woke up this morning thinking about a dragonfly. And, you know, it was 12 years ago that my friend's mom had cancer. And she said, you know, I wonder if there's anything else I can do. And I remembered another friend's dad who had had cancer, but he had done the Gerson therapy. He had healed, lived 22 more years after being given a stage three or stage four diagnosis in three months to live. And so I had to call him, get the name of this therapy. He said, it's the Gerson therapy. I had to Google it. Anyway, three days later, I was in a plane in flying into San Diego for the first training at the Gerson Institute as well. And then I ended up going on and getting certified. And now we have all these restaurants and a wellness center. But it is amazing how you can come across one element, one piece, one course, one training, and how it can really define the next 30 plus years of your life. So I love that you did that and that you came across that. But do you think that because you were already a naturopath and you already had um, a very intense background in sciences, I mean, did is that the reason why it resonated to you, that first course in the UK? No, no. What um, resonated for me was the fact that people healed. Right. But so that was that was the thing um and then when I got my qualifications or the first patient I took on I had two amazing patients right at the beginning one lady came to me and she'd already had she'd got lymphoma but she'd had it twice before so she'd had chemotherapy twice and what they teach you is that for a first patient take someone on who hasn't had the chemo so she was given six months to live and offered palliative chemotherapy and she found out about the Gerson therapy and came to me and I said, I don't know. Exactly. I, I don't know. I've never done this before. This is going to be a journey. Let's do it. And she healed. Okay. So I had the proof. The first case. The second case I had was a lady with myasthenia gravis. She was in her early 30s. She, the system, this is when the um, muscles don't, or the nerves don't talk to the muscles. So she was already, her face was paralyzed. So she had to have a sticking plaster to close her eyes at night. She could hardly speak. So she had to try and spell because we were doing it by phone. Um, <clears throat> So she had to spell out the words. She couldn't move very well, but she had a fabulous boyfriend who helped. And I treated her for about a year and nothing really happened. Then I heard nothing from her. And, and I was doing a course of workshops in Melbourne, Victoria, and I get a phone call while I'm down there. And she says, hi. And I said, oh my God, you can talk. And she said, yes. I said, how are you? She said, I'm cured. Wow. I said, will you come and speak to the people? Because I've got a lot of people with autoimmune conditions at this workshop. So she said, oh, I don't know. I'm really shy, but I'll come in at the lunch break. So she did. And when she walked in, there was not a dry eye in the house. Wow. It was absolutely incredible. And when people asked her, how long was it before you started to see a difference? She said, not long, really. She said, in about 15 months. And they all looked. And they said, but how did you keep on it for so long? And she said, well, what else was I going to do? And then they said, well, what has your doctor said? And she looked at them and she said, 
but I haven't got a doctor. <laughs> and it was so honest. And it was such a testimony to the to the, the fact that if you you can change the environment in the body and then the body will do what it knows best, which is to heal itself. So what you're doing as a patient or as a practitioner is just providing those conditions for the body to do it for itself. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, the therapy doesn't work. That's when you're therapy centric, mm -hmm. you're patient centric. What you're saying is, can my body respond to this therapy? How do I bring my body to a point where it can respond? So I always say that the outcome isn't dependent on the treatment. So you can have two people in hospital, same condition, same drugs. One person gets better, the other person doesn't. What's the difference? It's not the drug. It's not the medication. It's the person's capacity to respond. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about building resilience. It's actually building your capacity to respond to anything good or bad in the environment so that you can improve your odds on remaining well. So that's, that's the thing. So always be patient-centric. The fact that the Gerson therapy works in so many cases or will improve your odds is by the by. It's actually focus on the patient and where you're at or where they're at. So I love this story because it raises so many important points. Number one, we live in a place and a time in history where you know, people want results today. They want to take a pill and feel better tomorrow. They don't want to have pain anymore. They don't want to have suffering. And they also don't want to necessarily do the work. And so when you're taking on a new patient um, or client, you know, how do you explain this to them? Because of the fact that number one, this therapy is non-specific. So you can have somebody with an autoimmune disorder, infertility. I know you have worked with so many people around hormone issues, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. I mean, so many different conditions. And what do you say to people when they say, oh, it's so much work? Because it is one of the biggest complaints about the Gerson therapy for sure. And I see it with my clients. Well, I'm really lucky because I usually get patients who decided to do the therapy in any case. So they know what they're up for. They may have started the therapy already. I get patients who say, look, I know what it entails and I can't do it. Can you give me something that I can do? So I work with that. But in principle, I don't really have to sell, sell it people will come because they've got that understanding. Um, if they haven't, then I will send them away to do a lot of reading and I've got lots of, um, well, they might read my book and understand what's involved. But it's, it's difficult because unless a person can look at what's happening in health and understand that we are going in the wrong direction, Mm -hmm. If medications and pills and products were working, we wouldn't see 40 to 50% of the Western world with not one chronic disease, but two or more. So we're clearly going in the wrong direction from a point of resilience. Um, and if people can't appreciate that um, and factor that into their thinking and that what it may take in order to reverse that process, then there's not a lot that, that a practitioner can do. The patient has to be ready to come with them. Sometimes I'll say to a person, if an organic farmer is looking at a piece of land and he wants to return or restore that piece of land to its integrity, it takes seven years, all right, to get all the toxins out, to rebuild it, it is not a fast process it is a slow process and it's governed by the cycle those life cycles and it's same with the human body you know detoxification isn't an event it's a process it's a slow process so when you read about these 10-day detox 
plans, nothing's going to happen. You know, it takes six months to actually get the body or the cells to a point where they are eliminating toxins. People talk about liver detoxes, bowel detoxes, kidney detoxes. With Gerson therapy, we're talking about detoxification at cell level. Yeah. So if you see your body like a town and all the little cells are householders and they've all got their rubbish inside, what we have to do is we have to get the cells to put the dustbins out or the garbage out. We have to get the trucks or the circulation to come and pick it up. It then goes to the depot, which is the liver. The liver has to sort through it all and it has to discharge it. So it's a, it's a process that continues over many, many months. And as Dr. Gerson said, if we were to, if the body actually um, allowed all the cells to dump all their toxins at once, we would die of poisoning. So that's why it is slow and you can't rush it. And I, I really did appreciate the... Um, training when the doctors discovered they think oh patients who have chemotherapy they must be more toxic so we must drive it harder what they discovered is that patients went backwards so depending on the accumulated toxicity that those cells are holding on to to keep you safe it determines the speed of the journey and it's i often describe it, um, like I do a lot of Chinese medicine, we talk about yin and yang. So if you've got a person and we're looking at the constitution, how strong is it, how resilient? So if you see the yin as the body, so it's it could be a piece of nice dry, a, a strong yin is like a piece of dry hardwood and the yang is the flame or the function. So the flame will burn slow and long with that nice piece of hardwood. Now, when the yin or the substance of the body loses its resilience, it may be a piece of wet wood, okay? And the flame is very small, very vulnerable. What's going to happen if you come along with a great big pair of blowers to drive that? You're going to put the flame out. So it is that process of where you're looking at the person in front of you. What do I need to do to start rebuilding and dry that wood, rebuilding it and getting, letting the flame grow stronger? So it's all about rebuilding that physical integrity. It's not about driving the body or pushing it or flogging it. It's about the regeneration. It's a two-sided coin. It's a regeneration and detoxification. And what I feel in my clinical work is that people have so much less resilience mm -hmm. that if you push them with a very strong detoxification program, they will go backwards. And so I've noticed... Yeah, I've noticed the same thing as well with um, my clients as well. And it's interesting because they want, they feel like the harder you push, the better. And, uh, and I think that that's what, you know, where we are with all of these trending diets, like lose weight in seven days. And, you know, like you said, these 10 day liver detoxes. And for years, I always teach a workshop called the ultimate detox. But really, it's a way to get people into the room because I know it'll sell, right? Versus learn how to cook, not as exciting. Ultimate liver detox, very exciting. So it's a way to get them into the room. And the number one question, once I go through all the components of the Gerson therapy and what it takes to build that resilience and restore the body to its natural healing properties is that the first question people ask me is, so how long do I need to do this for? Which I think is one of the most interesting questions because you know, we're a human and if you're planning on being on the planet for 90 years or 100 years, that's how long you're going to be neutrifying your body, supporting your liver and detoxification, you know, making sure you're eating clean, good, wholesome food, eliminating the toxins put into their body. But it is, I always used to think of it as such a funny question, but in the context of our society now, um, it, it's definitely challenging. So for you in teaching the, these principles, 
Plus, I love this, the analogies that you always use in all of your books and you have great videos that you've created, um, which we'll put the links on this podcast so people can access them because you've created so many great resources to teach people uh, both the art and the science of restoring the body, building resiliency so they can actually reverse their diseases. So I want to definitely make sure everybody who's listening that they get access to uh, the links there. But in light of all of the trends over the last 33 years, um, how has that been for you in your work as you've seen these you know, programs come and go and then also with working with patients as well? Because it does affect them as they hear more and more things that are these quick fixes. What's it meant for me? It's meant multiple confusion. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So. Information overload, patients are more and more confused. Too much information, not enough knowledge. So they're bombarded with, you know, claims of new products, new treatments. So I suppose that is a wicked problem. That's what I call a wicked problem. So what ha was happening for me back in the early 2000s is people were coming They'd got a diagnosis, say it was cancer or a chronic disease. They didn't like their odds of survival uh, of what was being offered. They were taking multiple products along with their conventional treatment. They'd seen multiple practitioners. All of them had told them something different. They were utterly confused. They'd done their own research. They can't come to me. And they say, I'm taking all this stuff. I'm seeing all these practitioners. Can you tell me what I need and what I don't? All right. And I'm there just to give them yet another. I'm there to do my job, which is, well, you've come to me for Gerson therapy or for diet. Let's just do that. And they say, no, no, no. I'm confused. I want you to look through all my products. You know, what's this for? What? How, how much value? So it was a wicked problem. So I came up from the office one day and my husband was working in the um, kitchen and he had all his stuff spread over. He works uh, for governments and corporations. He does value mapping. And I said, what are you working on? And he showed, he, I had a look and I said, that's brilliant. I said, can I steal it? <laughs> So that was the beginning of the smart patient framework. So it's a value framework where it's a journey. So what I was able to do was I was able to put the, the question back to the patient and give them a framework where they could go and measure the value of the treatment against where they want to go. So what, what it is, the... the, the um, program that I'm currently running has been done four years of grounded research so I've been testing the model so the model's being built since 2006 basically then we did the four years of grounded research and we were able to get funding from the Queensland government to run the project for a year down in a uh, in um, south of Britain Brisbane south area and um so we've come up with the Ready Reckoner. So I published the book, which is the course companion guide after taking people on that journey. And what it is, is you, is the person is able to unpack their full case without being a medical expert. So that then becomes their starting point. It's where am I now and where am I heading if I do nothing? All right, so they know their starting point. Then they define where it is that they'd like to be medically. So they can have a good realistic idea of medically where I want to be. So that's my destination endpoint. And then what goals or waypoints or what towns do I need to go through in order to get to where I want to go? And I can monitor to make sure I'm going in the right direction. And then what they can do is they can match any practitioner or treatment to wherever, to whatever goal it is or, or wherever it is on their journey, and they can measure the value of that. So they may say, if a practitioner is saying, well, I think you should have IV, vitamin C twice a week, 
for your cancer in addition to everything else. So the patient's thinking, wow, that's going to be $400 a week. I can't even afford my um, organic food. Uh, but I have great faith in this vitamin C IV. So perhaps I should ditch you know, this other treatment and just do that without even asking, where will it take me? Will it shrink my cancer? Can you show me any results or clinical results that will are meaningful to me? So it's um, it's a it's so empowering for people to actually understand their case without being a medical profession, but they can understand their whole the geography of their case better than any practitioner. Very empowering, and it's actually transformed the journey for so many people where they are very clear on where they need to be focusing their strategy. And it always comes back down to what am I eating? Yeah. How much stress do I have? What am I? So I had to actually take my nutrition hat off, right? I, I, I had to be completely, so this model is completely treatment agnostic. And I had to not even, Half of the people didn't even know that I did nutrition. I was just somebody from somewhere that, it, you know, that I could have been a government official for all they knew. So I took that off. So it was just really finding out what people, when the light bulbs went on and finding out that people actually did have sufficient understanding and knowledge to put two and two together. And what was important was they had to do solution. It had to, it's very solution focused. So they had to actually look at what could work for them that was within scope. What we found was the people who were prepared to make incremental changes were the ones that did the best. And with those incremental changes, suddenly they started to see the possibilities. That it is not on effect, and it was so incredible. There was one lady on the program who had crest, which is an autoimmune condition, which means the body turns to plastic basically, but it's multi system. And she was, you know, the prognosis really wasn't very good at all for her, so she was looking at having PEG, which is um peg feedings so it goes straight into the stomach so her digestive system was starting to malfunction her um big problem was that she said her there was no one in charge all right so she had multiple specialists for for different systems of the body her doctor would try and you know, bring it together and help her. But she said no one and everybody, no one had the same opinion and she couldn't get the right treatment. So once she took hold of her case and she started putting in some of the solutions, she actually started juicing. Right now, I didn't tell her to do that, but someone let slip that, you know, that I, that they'd done, um, you know, that, that they knew more about what I did. So she asked me during the um, course if she could borrow my book and I lent it to her and she started juicing. Um, and then she went back to her spe specialist. This was at the end of the course. And he said to her, I don't need to see you for another six months. Your liver enzymes are perfect. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And she'd also lost 10 kilos during the process. So this wasn't me telling her what to do. This was through actually understanding what her starting point, where she wanted to end up, and then putting in the solution. So she'd worked out that probably diet was going to be integral. It was going to be at the basis of everything that she needed to do. She knew realistically she wouldn't be able to come off a lot of the medications because if she stopped them, she'd go backwards faster. So they did have a value. But where she wanted to go was to become less dependent and have better quality of life. So it's treatment agnostic. The, the training is treatment agnostic, but people do, they are able to work out their strategy 
and work out which things are going to have the most value. I love I love this. I took to your patient journey course uh, years and years ago because I saw the value of it. And there were so many tools in there that truly are designed to empower the patient to take their health into their own hands. And it doesn't mean they have to self-diagnose and self-treat, but it gives them so many tools so that their information is not being lost. I remember there was one chart in the book where patients keep all of their blood records on one page, as opposed to flipping through their binders and binders of all their lab results. But instead, it's all in columns, like an Excel sheet on one page. And so you can compare the trends, um, you know, across your lab work uh, as well. And that has helped so many of my clients because I use that tool with them. And I say, keep track of it and keep it on one page so you can see. And also you can go into your doctor and show them as well. And I've had clients who've been misdiagnosed because because their doctors have missed reading the lab results, like the five, six, 10 pages of lab results that come back and where they've gone back and said, explain to me why my results, you know, go up and down here. And the doctors have actually said, well, you have an autoimmune condition and we've, it has been undiagnosed for 10 years. Um, so I love that so much about um, what you teach because you build even though the Gerson therapy is far from, let's say, efficient as opposed, you know, when it comes to time management, there's so many tools that do make, turn your life and make it more efficient with how, you know, you, your family members, your children are going to be, let's say, handled and carried through the medical system as well, which I just have to say, thank you for doing that and making my life easier and my client's life easier as well. Now, yeah. I want to go back a little bit because um, for a lot of people who are listening, you know, they, so many people rely on their doctors to tell them what to do. But I want to go back to when you first learned about this, because you were a naturopath, and you had already been, you know, educated, let's say, under one particular framework, you had an understanding of traditional Chinese medicine, um, as well. But what was it like for you to learn about the Gerson therapy, having already gone through your schooling? And I imagine a lot of other natural paths probably didn't see things the same way. I think uh, for me, it was because the Gerson therapy was so aligned with my endpoint. Mm. All right, and th that was the clincher because I was looking for the magic bullet. All right, and this is this was and it has been proved the magic bullet for so many people. So the work that I do um, that isn't Gerson, so my dietary healing work, it's still based on those principles yeah. for um, cellular cleansing because what you're, um, you know, the um, whole principle of how do you get the cell to take up more oxygen, right? Well, the cell won't take up more oxygen if it's already chock-a-block full of toxins, okay? So it's very important, the whole process of that detoxification process is fundamentally to get the cell to work better by taking up the oxygen. So that, that is the bottom line. So, um, yeah. And so you must have been seeing a lot of patients coming from other natural paths and traditional Chinese medicine doctors who weren't putting as much emphasis on detoxification and nutrification as well, I imagined. Well, they, they weren't putting any emphasis on... Or any. <laughs> so, it, it, so it's just what they tend to do is treat the blood results, not the patient. So, for example, what they're, what they're measuring is an improvement in blood results. So they will give a high-protein diet, low-carb diet, in order to shift the blood glucose levels down. And then they say, oh, you're getting better. All right? But actually, the patient may not be getting better. They may be getting worse. But, but the lab results show yes. that they're getting better. So, but nobody's monitoring the patient's journey. Are they going forwards or backwards? What does that mean to the patient with their blood results 
getting better? Is it worsening another of their conditions? Are they healing? Does it mean that they're healing? Or does it just mean that I haven't got so much sugar in my blood system? See, the thing about diabetes is that you can lower your blood sugar level through diet, but that doesn't mean that the sugar's going into the cell. All right, so lowering of the blood sugar should be because the sugar is going into the cell for being burnt as energy. So the cells are still in starvation mode. In diabetes, that's technically what it means. Your cells can no longer take up the sugar, so they're starving. So how can you heal a starving cell? You know, and you're just pushing it deeper and deeper into that um, chronic toxicity. And so, you know, in 10 years, I'm sure that we'll start to see another disease, a new disease coming, which will be a consequence of not treating the diabetes properly. Actually, in the last, I, I, in the last, this is the, the latest book, The Ready oh. Reckoner. Uh, there we go, we can see it now. Ready yeah. Reckoner book. So this is the course companion guide. But on the last page, I don't know, can you read that? Oh, let me see. Yeah, I probably can. One second. Okay. Yep, I can actually. Can you read it out? <laughs> yeah, please don't die from the old diseases anymore. They die. Oh, people don't die. It said, please don't die. People don't die from the old diseases anymore. They die from the new ones. But that's progress, isn't it? So that's that's the... So that's the consequence of not actually reversing chronic disease. If you're yeah. managing it and thinking that you're stabilizing it, oh, that's good, it's stable, um, you will get a new chronic disease down the track. Exactly. And I love that you brought up the uh, point about diabetes, especially because that's the work that I do with Indigenous communities and um, and I don't know if I told you, but I'm going to be riding my bike across Canada. So it's about 7,000 kilometers across Canada, stopping off and working with and alongside Indigenous communities to really help uh, Indigenous communities, physicians and youth to remember that food is medicine, to remember that actually they've had thousands of years of this nutritional knowledge that has been lost over the last 100 to 450 years of colonization and so it's going to be an interesting journey but diabetes is the entry point for that conversation because diabetes is three to four times higher in indigenous communities than it is in non-indigenous communities but even in non-First Nations communities, diabetes is still high. It is, you know, rampaging the entire world. And I was, as I was saying to you in the beginning, just before we started recording, that, um, you know, I met with the Public Health Agency of Canada and their mandate to tackle diabetes was getting people to eat less sugar and to get into the doctors and be diagnosed so they can be put on their medications which is so seen and it's almost criminal because of the fact that number one, we know that diabetes isn't caused by eating sugar. And just like you said, and so there's so much teaching that needs to happen there, but at the government level, so we can start, you know, using the right approaches, but how has that been for you? Like, have you not been so frustrated over, I've only been doing this for 12 years and it's literally why I have so much gray hair, I'm sure, because I get so frustrated, but how has that been for you to watch incorrect, you know, biochemical knowledge be transmitted from person to person, government to government, so that we can never get to the true heart of, re of healing? Well, I think that that really underpins why I've done what I've done with this Ready Reckoner and why we're trying to um, get it in at that government level. We want government blessing because it, it has to be um, a grassroots thing. People, it's, it, it can't be a top-down or a paternalistic model. It has to be people have to have the willingness to change. So it's not a question about changing practitioners or changing the, the way that biochemistry or the knowledge is 
given. It's up to people to actually want to change and want to get better and start adopting those things. So I've gone straight, like you're going, straight to the villages and the communities. I'm going straight to the people because that is where the salvation will be. People have it within their own hands to make themselves better. They don't need... Um, they should, you should only need a doctor for acute treatment. But for chronic disease, it's within your own hands to, to fix it and to change it. I remember we had to, uh, when we were doing some of the grounded research, I spoke to a lot of doctors and they had a criticism. They said, well, nobody's going to do your program. And, I, and they were talking to me and I said, but you are part of that problem as to why they won't do it. And he looked at me shocked. And I said, because you tell people that there's no cure. Yeah, so okay. give up. You're telling people to give up. So that's where my frustration comes. It comes from that thing of people giving the wrong nutritional advice for people to, to get better but also from the medical profession itself, when it says it doesn't matter what you do, you can never change it. So I get pa cancer patients who will go and the oncologist still says, you need to do my treatment. And they'll say, well, what's the survival rate? And they say, oh, 60% will get to five years. And they say, well, that's not really very good. How can I make sure I get into that 60%? Right, and the oncologist will say, well, you know, I don't know. So it's just the luck of the draw. And then they say, um, do you think if I change my diet, that would help? And they say, no. So you've got the top down telling people, don't bother. And most people, if they don't want to put the hard work in, will think that's great. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'll just give up. When you get a critical mass of our society getting sick, with their children getting cancer, that's when we're going to see despair. And when you see despair, people go cold. They go off the boil and it becomes more difficult to get them to a point where they will be motivated. So it's a very dangerous situation that we're heading to if if despair comes. So I think that's what drives me and I do get frustrated, but the, the driving force in me is we mustn't give up. We mustn't give up and there'll be enough people. And once you reach a critical mass of people who are saying, yes, we are gonna do it. We're gonna clean our environment. We're gonna start eating clean food. We're gonna look after our children. We're gonna put in the extra work that it takes. And it doesn't take a lot once you make it a lifestyle thing. It really doesn't. In um, COVID-19, I have to say, <laughs> because we can't go to the shops, right? We Like once a week, but I, I'll go to the shop maybe twice a week. I had to really get my fridge sorted out and my... Um, menu plan because normally it would be from day to day I spend a lot of time in the kitchen but it's usually at the end of the day when I least like doing it but we still do it but since I've had to get my routine together it's been fabulous right so you can you can do it with clean food freshly prepared all our meals are freshly prepared and it is and it yeah. is doable. Like I often say to my clients, you know, when, you know, you're already spending time either going shopping. So you have to buy the goods, the products, the produce, whatever it is. So whether you're buying a bag of chips or a head of lettuce, it literally takes the same amount of energy, right? And then when you get home, you know, you have all your products and I get it when you know, you don't have good knife skills, let's say, or you don't have, you know, you haven't spent much time in the kitchen. And so you might want to use the excuse that I don't know how to cook or prepare healthy foods, but it's still the same amount of time that it takes to read, you know, how do I cook the instructions on this packaged food as it would take to literally open up and be like, oh, chop, 
the tomatoes and put them in the pan and boiled them or whatever it is. And so we're just exchanging our time and an energy for doing it a healthy way that's going to heal our bodies and our families' bodies and our community's bodies. Because when your friends come over to eat, you can feed them this healthy food as well. And then, of course, you know, I look at it that, you know, when my family gets extremely lazy, you know, I'll, I can always tell when that happens because I'll be like, oh, we have more recycling, you know, even though we'll choose the healthiest cracker. But I'm like, now I have to deal with the recycling versus, you know, like the compost is super easy to deal with here because we have a farm. We just put it in the um, chicken coop. We have chicken as pets, which are super cute. Um, and they'll eat it or we just take it and drop it off the recycling food. But we're not sorting through all of this stuff. So it truly is an exchange of energy, not usually taking more energy. It's just how you're using your existing. So I'd like to tell my clients that. So I love that you brought that up because COVID has been so fantastic. We've heard of more people growing their own food, more people learning how to cook, um, which is amazing because in the year 2020, I think that there was a stat that came up and it was so sad, but where people actually no longer even know how to cook because they eat out almost every single meal. So COVID might have been a true blessing in disguise for a lot of people because they're returning back to the land and returning back to the kitchens where the healing truly is. Yeah. So I love that you brought that up. And so when, let's go back to that one point that you made when you said the doctors, you know, say, you know, your diet has nothing to do with your disease. So don't do anything. And, you know, there's nothing you can do. We've done it all, for example. And that has happened to me all the time, almost with every single client who's ever come to me. They said, my doctor said, there's nothing I could do. And then they're standing in front of me and I'm here to tell them, actually, there's There's a few more things you can do, actually, and let's just give it a shot. And so what is it like when you were teaching those early practitioners when you first, you know, got on the Gerson Institute board and you wrote the practitioner manuals for the training to train practitioners? Who were these practitioners that were coming and signing up for these courses? What was different about them? Um, Well, I taught Melania, who's head of the Hungarian um, clinic so uh, they were practitioners who already had existing practices she had actually done the Gerson therapy and was a recovered patient so they were pretty much at the um, top of their field if you like in in their work and wanting to embrace the therapy but very few will actually go on and take it up as a core business Mm. because it is so intensive it's like I get practitioners who will send patients to me because they say you know it's it's too hard actually what's hard is the amount of time it takes to unpack the case and to deliver a program that is individualized for that patient but I've never um I'm not, I'm not interested in, in, it's like for me, I can only take on two new patients. If I had two new patients on in a day, or I would only see maximum of three patients a day because of the time. So it is time consuming. And I think that's the big problem with Gerson therapy is because we are monitoring so many things, not just blood results. Um, we're also watching for points of regeneration for how the body is detoxifying and we have to change the medications to fit with those because it is a journey and you have to make sure the person is going in the right direction you have to they have to see their other um, specialists with their scans and however they're monitoring them. So that all has to be factored in and it has to be recorded. And it's a big responsibility for a practitioner because if you don't do that, as a practitioner, I'm not allowed to treat cancer 
all right? So I have to keep very good records, which I share with my patients. So everything that I do is transparent and any decision we make is a joint decision. So it, it's that, that practitioner pathway can be fought with difficulties. But a lot of practitioners have said, you're so brave. You are. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're so brave. And it's like, well, you know, we, I, I sort of found my way through it. I've been through some really hairy situations with the medical board and people coming, you know, one surgeon was really, I had this patient, I have to tell you, he was in his 70s. He had bad, he was German. He had bowel cancer and he had, it was at the rectum and it was the size of an orange. Okay. And he said, I said, I, you know, it's stage one. It's nowhere else. You should have surgery. So I recorded it. And we, so it was all in, in the notes. And he said, no, I'm not going to have surgery. The Gerson therapy is going to fix it. Okay. So his surgeon was going ballistic with him. And by the at about nine months, he took my book into his surgeon and he said, This is my practitioner, and I'm doing what she says. You know, she's really good. So, of course, he writes to me and he writes to my governing body and he says that I'm being, um, you know, that by default of my advice, my patient's going to die and X, Y, and Z. So I'm talking with my patient and I said, what did you do? And he said, oh, he said, I just took your book in and I think, oh my God. So because I keep lots of notes, I was able to record all of that. I was able to write to the surgeon and I said I was happy for him to take things forward and I would produce my notes if and when it gets to that point, but I wasn't going to divulge any information that was patient confidentiality and I was just like this. So anyway, in the event, after about a year, the tumor didn't shrink for this person and I didn't think that it would. Well, we hope that it would, but it was it was one of those situations where it would have been better for him to have the surgery. So he decided to have it out. And when he woke up after surgery, the, the sister came to him and she said to him, I just wanted to let you know that when they did the surgery, your tissues and your bowel, your bowel tissues were like that of a teenager. All right, so he, the healing that he'd done, because very often in old people, when you cut away bits, you're worried about where you stitch them back together and if it's going to fray or how well it's going to heal. But his tissues were so um, phenomenal. And I have to tell you another story. <laughs> well, I just, okay, hang on to that story because I just want people to understand what you just said here, because this is really, really important. And number one, even if the body is in a disease state, the body still wants to live. It still wants to heal. And we know through, for example, Beata Bishop, uh, we did a, a podcast with her and she told her story um, about having cancer and it returning and then her body pretty much encapsulating her mass in her groin in basically almost like a really thick eggshell. So to prevent the cancer cells from metastasizing outside of the tumor and throughout her body. And when they went in to remove it, they were able to just snip it out and they were so shocked that it wasn't attached by all these blood vesicles. So here she is a super healthy woman, but with a mass in her and she's considered healthy. They, she wanted to have the mass removed so it wasn't a memory of it and she didn't have to feel it in her body. I've had the same situation happen with several of my clients where they've done the Gerson therapy. We still, you know, suggest, I mean, I don't diagnose or prescribe, but working with a practitioner like yourself, um, you know, or another one of their chosen practitioners, you know, we might decide that chemo or surgery is an option that can either go alongside the Gerson therapy or come before, during, or after it as well. So a lot of people think that 
oh, well, if I'm doing the Gerson therapy, I can't do anything else. But that's what I love about the work that you do, as well as almost every trained, um, you know, Gerson practitioner who is a good practitioner, is that they're not against other treatments, let's say, because it's about looking at the individual, correct? And making sure that every step that's taken between now you know, and the next step is all in service of getting that patient or client to the end goal. And it That's might right. mean needing to cut out a mass that may or may not shrink alongside the Gerson therapy, but it doesn't mean you're still not getting yourself healthy. So you don't have to just throw the Gerson therapy out, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. No, that's right. That's right. It's about, a it's the same journey um, analogy. <clears throat> it's about going forward and so you're looking at if I don't do that particular treatment at that particular time am I going to go forward or backwards all right and then you may say oh I'm going to go backwards because it could spread so I need to do this type of treatment but it's going to be only to stop me from going backwards and give me time in order to build myself up to go forwards I love that. That's something, it's so important for people to understand this part is so important uh, about your journey because people want definitive answers. If I do that, will I get that result? And really it's more, if I do that, will that buy me time to allow my body self-healing mechanisms to come back alive and to do what they're designed to do and that that will bring me to that end result. So I love that. So what is the other story? Please share. I love stories. Stories well, are what makes the world go around. Uh, he was again. He was um, an elderly gentleman in his seventies. I mean, I'm sixty six now. I hate it when I say elderly because I'm going to be there too. But You're so I'm young. <laughs> the um, this this man he came to me. He had stage four prostate cancer, so it was in the the bones. So it had metastasized to the bones. And so he went on the Gerson therapy. Now, he didn't make it in the sense that he survived, um, but he, the time that he did survive, he was more or less pain-free. But what happened was is his wife wrote to me just after he died, and she said to me that she just wanted to say that she'd had a, um, a phone call from the mortuary and they'd said to her, would she donate his body for research because they had never seen such a healthy corpse. Wow. That is so, amazing. So despite him having that disease, the body was healthy. And that's what Dr. Max Gerson found too with his patients. Um, especially prior to doing introducing the coffee enema. Um, and I remember reading stories that, you know, sometimes, especially because cancer wasn't something he first got into working with patients with cancer when he first had discovered and designed the Gerson therapy. But when he did, um, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong on this story, you might know better, but um, that his patients, some of them did die. And when they did the autopsy, they actually found that the patient was cancer free and their bodies were extremely healthy, but they died of liver cirrhosis because there wasn't the de liver detoxification component yet brought in to the Gerson therapy. And that's when Dr. Max Gerson really realized the value and importance of having a way to support the liver as it's eliminating all of this necrotic tissue and all of this metabolic waste that the body builds up every single day, not just as a result from having the disease, but as a result of just being human. So that's when he implemented uh, the coffee enemas to support patients. He, he, what he found was that um, patients with cancer would go backwards on his program. So a patient without cancer, say they just had the lupus, um, would go forwards. But if they had cancer, they would go backwards quicker than just with the disease itself. So going in the wrong direction. So he then had to say, what is happening 
within in this patient or within cancer patients that's making them go backwards because the treatment's not helping. So he would because he he was a genius. He was a genius. Mm-hmm. He understood the therapeutic application of his program. He understood detoxification and that that was what was happening. So he surmised until he proved it that the body was creating from the from the cancer too many toxins for the liver to be able to get rid of so he said right i'll put in the coffee enema because they knew that that would stimulate the liver and of course the patients didn't go into those crises anymore and they were able to move forward so that's what a treatment adding a treatment that has proven clinical impact positive impact on the case and that's how he did it with his methodology he knew what he was looking for by which to measure the improvement in the patient so he never added things unless he could measure either shrinkage of the tumor he he did a lot of um uh products or he did a lot of work with patients where he could see the cancer so he'd test, if he put a new product in, he'd test it by seeing how that, that um, tumour reacted. So he was, he, it, what I loved about Dr. Gerson's work was that he never put two and two together to make 22. Right, so he, his, his work isn't littered with hypotheses. He might have started with a hypothesis, but then set out to, to prove it, it within the clinical setting. Yeah, That's no, he was a true... Yeah, he was a true scientist, for sure. Thing, you know, with the, the thing about people saying, why can't I have um, essential oils or pineapple or some of the ber- red berries? And what he said was that the, the aromatic compounds that they had, for some people, um, it meant that they didn't go forwards on their journey. Now we understand that those phenolic compounds place a huge burden on the liver sulfation pathways. Right now, if you're in good health, <clears throat> um, that's not going to matter. But if you if your cancer and your liver is using all the pathways, it's like a big motorway, six channels to get the toxins out. If you're stressing one of those pathways with all these phenolic compounds, because they are toxins in the body, the body has to get rid of them. Um, then. You, in some patients, you will see them having reactions. So what he did, his, his program is quite generic. It's what he found worked for everybody. And that's the safest place to start. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the hardest pieces for my clients to understand is to know the difference between a healthy body with a healthy liver and their body that's in this disease state. And so because they're so accustomed to following, you know, whatever the media says or whatever somebody else in their blog says, you know, about a particular food or therapy. So, but I thought berries were good for you. Why can't I have berries? Why can't I have pineapple? And instead of stopping to ask the question, well, I'm curious as to why Dr. Gerson said you know, no berries, like what is it about berries? What is it about pineapple? What is it about canned food and so on? What is it about alcohol? And so for sure in a healthy body, alcohol isn't wonderful by any means, but your body can deal with it before it damages your body too much, let's say. But in an unhealthy body, when you add that alcohol, then the ripple effect is huge. And so people need to understand that. And it is definitely one of the hardest things for people to wrap their head around is, you know, even for people who want to even just try adopting the principles of the Gerson therapy in a healthy body, you know, they're often say things like, well, I'll do this for a little while, but not long term. And, you know, it's really important for people to understand that, you know, 
you, you're dabbling in it so that you can make the lifestyle changes that so you can stick with it long term because these are the principles that our body lives by. We are nature and we need clean food and we need food that's low in toxins and pesticides and everything like that. And we need to keep our liver healthy long term. But I, I would say that's the biggest challenge I have with my clients for sure is getting them to know the difference between unhealthy and or a healthy and a diseased body. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where when you so in some of my early workshops um, where we're looking at the constitution of the body, people can start to discover through the different symptoms that they've had during their life, how um, stressed the liver may be. So there's lots of symptoms relating to liver chi stagnation or liver yin deficiency that people would never normally associate being with their liver. So once you start re reducing the load on the liver, that's all you need to do in order for the liver to heal. It's not what you put in, it's what you leave out. Right. Once you start reducing that load, then these other symptoms that you never thought were related to the liver disappear. I so, love that. I had to take a note of that. It's not what you put in, it's what you leave out. Yeah, no, that is brilliant. Can you talk a little bit more about the liver for people? Because uh, often, you know, I have clients or not even clients, just friends who say very common things like, you know, I wake up at two o'clock in the morning all the time. I don't understand why I'm so healthy. Um, or they say, you know, they're often talking about the symptoms of a liver that is not healthy, even though they're thin and they can go out and exercise and, you know, they would say that they are healthy, but meanwhile, they have all of these symptoms creeping up. Can you just talk a little bit more about what those symptoms are so people can understand that? And then as well as just talking about the two phases of liver detoxification so people can understand that from a Gerson perspective, but also a Chinese medicine perspective, because this is a part that I've always found so fascinating, and I love the way you explain it in your books. Okay, so the liver is the principal engine for you to um, actually get rid of all your waste and detoxify all your hormones, get them out of the system. So if the liver becomes compromised, or stuck or stagnant, then you're going to get hormonal problems. So, for example, if the liver can't get rid of the estrogen in the body, then the estrogen will slowly start to reach a point where it's not that high, but it's at a point where the um, brain doesn't recognize that you need to start the next cycle. So, estrogen has to drop really low in order for the brain to kick in to mature the, the egg. So a lot of our infertility problems are due to this estrogen persistence in um, because the liver can't detoxify it. So you've got the hormonal things that are attributed with the liver. The liver is attributed to a lot of joint problems. You've got this whole thing of fibromyalgia where people are in such chronic pain. What the Chinese say is if dampness, that means toxicity, settles in the muscles, it is very difficult to shift. All right, so the lymphatic system, because the liver isn't cleaning, the, it, it's like a supermarket. You know, you've got the checkout check, the liver, so it gets, all, gets everything out of, let's say it's to remove the waste. But, in, but if it can't, then you've got the boys, say, that come in at night to actually put everything back in the place. They find all this garbage in the aisles. So the immune system then has to, to come in to try and get rid of it. So the immune system only becomes part of that process if the liver isn't doing its job. And then as a consequence of the immune system trying to do its job, it creates more congestion, more swelling, more fluid, more toxicity. You know, we, we're now aware of the cytokine storm. So you get all of that happening in the aisles of the supermarket rather than the aisles being clean. So the liver has an immense, it's what they call it, it moves and processes. So if the liver comes to a standstill, if it gets stuck, then everything in the body 
get stuck. In terms of when we talk about liver yin deficiency, when the processes are breaking down, you get what we call empty heat in the body, which translates sometimes into a hyperactive mind, so it doesn't rest at night, so you get the insomnia pictures. Once you start restoring the liver through what you leave out and helping it to clear the backdrop, get the high potassium, the low sodium things happening, that's the single most important piece of advice. Chemical free, fresh food, salt free, yeah. high in fruits and vegetables. If somebody just does that, then they will start to um, shift those toxins. And then the liver can start to function properly, and that then has a knock-on effect on the rest of the body. Does that help explain? Yeah, I think it's brilliant because I know that for anybody who doesn't have a science background in biology or biochemistry or uh, nutrition or you know anything related to the human body, let's say, then they might not understand. And I know from working with clients, they just don't understand you know, the importance of the liver in the body and how it's one of the, I mean, every organ is important for sure, but it is the one organ. If you need a liver transplant and there's not a liver on the list, you're dying, right? Yeah. If your liver, but you know, we can put you on a kidney bypass, you know, indefinitely for quite a long time. We can take out your spleen and you're still going to live. We can remove your pancreas and we have an ability to keep, you know, those hormones um, still filtering or pumping through your body through medications. Um, but the liver is so, so important. But when I even ask people to point out where their liver is in their body, most of my clients don't even know where it is at all. Yeah. But um, okay. Oh, I'll give you a good saying, which you need to write down. It's a very old saying. I think it might have its origins in Chinese traditional medicine. But it is, if you look after the liver, the kidneys and the heart will look after themselves. Mm. And when we're talking about the heart in Chinese medicine, the heart is related to the mind as well. So it houses the mind, the heart houses the mind. So what, you, what we're looking at is if we look after our livers and we keep the body moving properly, then we shouldn't be seeing all the dementia. All right. So dementia is now the fourth leading cause of death worldwide. It's come from nowhere. In the 1980s, it was way down on that list. So in the last 40 years, it's become the fourth leading cause of death. That's a really frightening statistic. So yes, the liver is, you've got to look after your liver. Yes, yeah, no, so important. And what you said too, just about how frightening it is to see dementia, you know, over the last 20 years, just really take off and, and become again, another leading chronic disease. But, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic right now with COVID, but we are amidst a massive epidemic of chronic disease, just literally taking people's lives, more lives than, you know, the amount of people that will ever die from COVID you know, at all. We have people dying every single day from heart disease, diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, and, you know, and many people suffering as well from infertility and things that they don't necessarily need to be suffering from. And these diseases are very, very reversible by literally doing, you know, what you just said here, when you look after the liver, the heart and the kidneys will look after themselves. And, you know, it's so important that people understand that. So, where I want to take it from here, because you have this brilliant new program that has come out. And part of me was a little bit sad, I would say, because I can't, I could probably name about maybe five practitioners around the globe that uh, have the depth of knowledge that you do. And so I was like, who am I going to send all my clients to if you're reducing your patient intake, you know, to launch an amazing program like this. But at the same time, I understand that you know, you've been doing this work for a long time. And as you do this work, 
you become more in tune with what patients truly need to make the right decision. So you've created this program that's really about empowering patients. I, I, my, my doors are still open for patients. Yes, your doors are still open. <laughs> And so I'll still always continue to send people your way. So tell us about this program, because I just think it is brilliant. Um, and I really, yeah, I can't wait to, I'm going to be signing up for it. It starts in August, late August? Yeah, yes, the 26th of August. So it's a five-week program, one hour a week with me, and then you do your homework, which probably take you an hour or two hours. So it takes you through the whole journey where you unpack your case, you work out, so you work out your starting point. I teach you how to work out your medical endpoint and how you build trust, how you actually ask the right questions for what you're monitoring. We work out the, um, I show you how to work out the value of treatments and do research so that you actually end up with a strategy that is um, focused, it's the best mix of treatments to get you to where you want to be. Just, you'll have to ask me questions around that. That's, it. That's in, in principle how it works. So, so just over five weeks, you can, become, you can become more informed about your case than any practitioner. Exactly. And that's the point that I love the most about this program, because we really do have to take our health back into our own hands and learn how to make the right decisions for ourselves. Because when you have a seven and a half minute appointment with your doctor, there's virtually no way when it comes to chronic disease cases that they can help you make that decision or make that decision for you. They can do it if you go in having a heart attack. So that's an acute condition. When you're in the middle of a heart attack, no problem you want to see your doctor. If you are in the middle of, you know, an anaphylactic shock because you were stung by a wasp and you're an allergic, that is something your doctor and their medical team can help you with. When you go in and you say things like, I'll just use myself as an example because I'm going to be um, bringing this up in this course, um, you know, that I started running and all of a sudden I noticed I just have these interesting dark lines coming in under my eyes that never were there before. And because I know about the body, it's easy for me to quickly say, well, is that spleen or is it, you know, something else in the body, but, you know, or is it my liver? What is happening? But I mean, I'm going to be coming forward with that. I don't, wouldn't say I have a chronic disease at all right now that I am aware of. I have a little bit of aching in my knees, which I know 100% can go away if I even just better my diet, probably get more sleep and detoxify my liver a lot better. But these are some things that I'm going to be bringing forward. So do you have to have a chronic disease to be able to do this course? To get, no, you don't, because you'll learn the model. And then in the future, if you need to use all the attributes, you can. Um, but if you do have a chronic disease and you're you need to work out your options, then you're going to be able to learn it as you go. So for example, I have one person at the moment doing it who, she's not menopausal yet, she's coming up to menopause, but she's got osteoporosis and she's, her, and she's got a couple of other things as well. So she's got an, an autoimmune condition as well. Her endocrinologist had put on the table what he wanted her to do and he told her that she was at risk of vertebral fracture and a whole heap of problems if she didn't go on this particular drug. She didn't want to go on the drug, but she didn't know what else to do, or she didn't know what would work. So we're looking at what worked. When we actually looked at the value of the drug, what we found is that it, it will the odds of it working for her were one in 200. So it means you have to treat 200 people for three years to reduce the risk of one fracture. And that is what staggers so many people, is what the recommendations are actually based on. Not only did she find that, but the research showed that if she came off the drug after three years, that her levels of her bone mean density would drop 
within 12 years to what they were before and that she was at risk, she was at three times at risk of fracture during that two year period after she came off the drug. So we're looking at it, what value is this drug for me in terms of my overall journey? Where will it take me? So it may appear to take me forward, but actually my default endpoint, if I go on this drug, is to be worse off. So without any medical understanding or minimal, she's able to make an informed decision where she doesn't have to feel nervous or anxious that mm -hmm. she has made the wrong decision. And she's able to now go to her endocrinologist and say, I appreciate, you know, why, you know, I appreciate that you recommended this, but for me, with the odds of it working, you know, one in 200 and where I could end up, I, I'm not ready to take that step. And that's what I really love about this program. And actually, you've taught something similar in other programs in the past as well, where it's, you know, asking that question, you know, what, how will I be if I take this? Is the, you know, what is the prognosis? So what is the outcome if I take it? What is the prognosis if I didn't take the drug? which I remember that being a very great question. You taught that in another course. So if I don't take the recommended treatment, what would happen to me? And then, you know, what would happen if I tried something else? Like, for example, changing my diet and all of that. And so when you ask those questions, you get a very different answer than, you know, most people to, to the question, is, you know, well, what do I need to do, doc? I've got diabetes. What's the answer? The, the, the killer question where you'll always get a straight answer is what's going to happen to me if I don't take it? Yeah. Right? So they will always say, well, within five years, X is going to happen or Y is going to happen. And then you can think, well, I've got five years to make a difference. Yeah. All right? So this is about making decision making. So you've got it from the horse's mouth, your time frame. Yeah. You they may say within six months, you'll have a heart attack or, you know, it's really dodgy. Or if you don't do the treatment now, it will deteriorate within six months and we will not be able to offer you that treatment as a standalone. You'll need to have three treatments. All right. So then you're actually being able to factor in without being a medical specialist, what those options are, what it's going to mean to you if you do or if you don't. Yeah, I love that. That's there's been so many insights that I've you know um, taken away from all of your you know your blogs and your books. And I mean, it's I feel that what you've been teaching all of these years needs to number one be at the core of medical school curriculum. Like it really needs to be taught to physicians across the planet. And but it also needs to be at the core of just a basic grade 10 or 11 course, you know, for students in high school, because we know they're going to be unleashed into the world where they're, you know, if they have parents that cook well for them, then, you know, they're going to probably find themselves drinking a lot, not eating well, but, and finding out, you know, that they're going to, as young Young humans on the planet, they develop things like anxiety and panic attacks and skin rashes and all the things that you get in your 20s. You know, now though, we see a lot of these young people getting heart disease and diabetes and even MS in their 20s when normally they wouldn't see those diseases until they're 60. So this is one of the reasons why I just think that what you teach really needs to be taught in high schools to empower youth as well to make these decisions for them. And, and more importantly, to know that like, even from just those two questions, what will happen if I take the drug? What will happen if I don't take the drug? That often when I've had my clients ask their, ask their doctors, they actually realize their doctor doesn't know a heck of a lot about the drug because it's a rep that's coming, a pharmaceutical rep that's just telling the doctor, this is what you're supposed to prescribe for this condition. And the doctor says, okay, then this is the new drug of, you know, for this month or this year, but the doctor doesn't really know a lot about the drug itself. So just by asking that question, again, you're empowered to know that, you know what, your doctor might not have all the answers and therefore you have to go out there and get them. That's right. That's right. And I have taught doctors 
and we've done the research on the drugs and they have been shocked at what the research is saying. And they have said to me, but we have to prescribe these drugs because if we don't, we could get done for negligence. So this is yeah. the, the academic, you know, the, the medical board. They ratify certain treatments for certain conditions and that's what we have to do. I had a patient once, she had stage one breast cancer. It's actually a recent patient. She comes from a family of um, oncologists. She's a psychotherapist herself and she decided to do Gerson therapy. Very often what can happen when you've done Gerson therapy is in certain cancers, is you in breast cancers, is a spot can come back on the scar tissue. So she and it did. And I said, don't worry, you'll be able to just have that removed. And another one might come, but within five years, no more will come. So her, but her oncologist said, no, you have to have chemotherapy, it's come back. Um, and this is the procedure so she's in a, a cold panic because she's not going to do that and she finds this amazing study it was done in Denmark I think or Belgium for like 50,000 people so it was a retrospective meta-analysis where they discovered that actually it was better not to have that for that particular staging and that type of breast cancer so she went to see her oncologist and she just said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And, um, you know, I have done my research and I, I really feel that this is the wrong thing. And he looked at her and he said, you've chosen the right thing. Wow. I was not she, expecting she that. Was so, she said she was horrified. He said, I had to give you, I had to tell you to do that because that is the standard procedure and he said and I would fail my students in their exams if they did not prescribe that. I've and actually that's... put one of her quotes in the book um, where she actually talks about it's just a short quote where she says that she she I can't find it now where she no, uh, what she felt uh, about that process and how empowered she was after that that it, was, yeah. it is it is okay to make your own choice but when you know that you're making the right choice and it's not just on a hunch yeah and that is what is so important about your program as well is that and I get it from both sides I get it from the doctor side and I get it from the patient side as well that you know the doctor's hearing a lot of you know, the patients come in and saying, well, I did my research, but there's a difference between, you know, reading somebody's blog. There's a difference between just going on the internet and just looking at what random people had to say. I think anecdotal stories are brilliant stories, especially when people are honest and really tell the details of their experience from diagnosis to the journey, you know, getting treatment, whatever it is, as long as they're honest and saying all the things that they did, I think that's wonderful to contact that person and, you know, maybe reach out to them and ask them more questions. But doctors get patients who said, well, I did my research and, you know, and a lot of times they're not really truly coming with research. It's not the meta-analyses or the retrospective studies or the population epidemiological studies or the clinical trials that they're looking at. They're looking it's just not research, but what you're doing is teaching people truly how to do the same quality of research that a doctor or scientist would do who was and diagnosed what, with the disease. That's right. And what, what the patient learns to do is look at their odds. What are, their, what are my odds? So it's just like with, you know, if you're a gambler and you're betting on horses, it's like, what are the odds of this horse getting to the finishing line? And when you see that the odds aren't that great, you're going to be thinking, well, why would I do it? So then you go back to the drawing board and you say, why am I doing it? Well, maybe it's just to stabilize the case. But what else can I do in order to move forward while I'm stabilizing the case? 
So you're making really informed. Those are informed decisions. It's not about having under medical understanding or, you know, being having to do the job of a practitioner yourself. It, 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 I, I, you know, the health profession is the only profession health and legal and accountancy is probably the only three professions where we give over our power nothing else if we go to a shop to buy something say it's a hardware shop you're going to go into that shop and you've got something wrong in your house you're not going to go to a 16 year old who just does a saturday job you're going to look around for an assistant who looks like they might have some idea about plumbing you're going to go and say to them, this is my problem. I need to fix it. Have you got anything? They might say, well, it could be this or that. I'm going to give you this. If it doesn't work, come back and we'll try that. All right. So you, before you buy something, you have to know the odds of it working for you. Exactly. Against what it is you're trying to do, what it is you're trying to fix. With, with medical, we just say, well, they will know. You know, I'm going sick. Here's all my records. My practitioner will know where I want to go. It's like going to a travel agent saying, I want to go on holiday. And the travel agent picks your holiday for you. It might be horrendous. You have to know where your practitioner is heading. Yeah. I say to people, when you're going on a journey and the bus is coming and you can't quite read what's on the front of the bus, you're going to ask the bus driver before you get on that bus, are you going to this town? They may say, no, I'm going halfway there. So they'll take you on one leg of the journey. You'll need to get off here and then you catch a different bus. So it's actually a journey is about which leg of the journey do I need what type of practitioner to help me? And then you pre-qualify with that practitioner. Can you get me here? within this time period and what will you use to get me here and how can we monitor to make sure the bus has actually left the bus stop because people end up on the same treatment in the hope that it will work and I'll say how long have you been taking that product or how long have you been with that practitioner and they say for two years I didn't like to leave them because they were so nice. Nice. Being so nice is not a pre-qualifying criteria for the bus leaving the bus station. So I, it's, I, it's the mindset. We have to get you into a customer-centric mindset. And that's what the training does. Puts you in charge of your purse. Yeah. Your choices. Yeah. Well, and, you, I, and that's exactly the same thing that so many people have said to me. So many of my clients, they say, well, my oncologist is so nice. And I said, yeah, but if you were to go and ask another really nice oncologist, what would that other really nice oncologist who cares about you and wants the best for you, what would they say about your prognosis your diagnosis and your treatment plan. And so when I often send my clients to go get a second opinion, which is in some countries, it's really hard to do. If you have one oncologist, that's it. You get that one oncologist. Whereas here in BC, we can, if you're smart about it, you can get a second and sometimes even a third opinion. And when I've done that for my clients and they've gone to do that, what they come back with is fundamentally different treatment plans, different prognosis, different everything from one going to, oh, she had a very aggressive breast cancer and right at the age where if she had been 55, it wouldn't have been as bad, but because she was 35 and, and based on her hormone levels, it was very aggressive. And for her, I mean, the first, first doctor said, oh, we don't even give that treat, that chemo. And we're just going to do a double mastectomy. And the second doctor said, well, we don't need to do a mastectomy at all. In fact, we could just do a lumpectomy, but we are going to give you that chemo, but we're going to do it in the reverse order. And so then she was so confused. She went for a third, um, you know, a third to go see a third oncologist. And that oncologist was like, uh, no, I'm going to ask you about what you have been doing, what your end goal is. And finally, she was able to find an oncologist who doesn't practice, you know, I wouldn't say like you, Catherine, but um, at least ask some of the similar questions, you know, said, oh, you're willing to change your diet. You're willing to do this as well. Okay, well then what we can do based on 
that is we can give you this third treatment plan, which again, didn't require having a double mastectomy. And that's huge, right? Because how many women have complications from the mastectomy, right? And does, does it work? When we talk about does it work, does it mean that you survive longer? Does it mean exactly. that it's a What does that mean? So those are the questions. If I do what you say, what's going to happen that would yeah. be better than if I didn't do what you say? Yeah. So I I'm definitely. Yeah. Oh, no, go on, go on. I had a patient, he had kidney cancer, so he had the kidney removed. But, they, but it had spread and they couldn't get the spread because it was wrapped around one of the key arteries. Now, he was in his 70s and when he walked into my office, he was black and blue all over. They would got him on warfarin, which is a blood thinner, but they'd never reduced the dose or taken it off him because they were convinced that he only had six months to live. So why would they bother, um, particularly if... When cancer progresses, it can make the blood sticky. So for them, it was a preventive thing. But for him, it was a quality of life thing. So we actually negotiated with the oncologist over a period of time to change the medication to one that wouldn't make him black and blue. But also when he went on the therapy, he didn't do Gerson therapy because he, he decided he didn't. He just did six juices a day. Um, she, he went for one of his tests and she said the um, treatment's working, the treatment, the drugs that she'd given him. She said they're suddenly working. You know, that's fantastic. And he said he didn't say to her, oh, well, you know, maybe it's because I've made these changes. He did so well. He is still alive now. And this is like 12 years later. Um, he did so well that he was able to negotiate a drug, what we call a drug holiday. Now that means if you come off a drug when you're on long-term treatment, you can't go back on it under the government scheme, so you have to pay for it. But she said to him, if I write it in as a drug holiday, it means that you haven't technically come off it, but we're just giving you a break. So she was able to get around the system and eventually she started working with him. And this is what we're talking about is, is we don't want to make enemies. No. We want to find practitioners who can work with us and they will know <clears throat> that, they, that you're, you're in charge. Hang on a minute. <clears throat> so for example, what it's like as a practitioner is you're in a car, driving a car, no, the patient's in the car, driving the car, and they want the practitioner in the passenger seat. And the practitioner's looking at the patient, and the patient has a blindfold on, and they're heading straight for a brick wall. But they're thinking that they're going in there, Dr. Google says this, or so-and-so said that, or I read that, and the practitioner is thinking, stop the car and let me out. If you're in that driver's seat and you don't have the blindfold on, that you are aware of those risks, the practitioner will come along with you. They will. And because it gives them safety. It's not well, exactly. safe for a patient who has no idea where they're heading and won't factor in any of the risks because they're basing everything on faith. That is not a good place to be oh my gosh I'm so excited to take this course um and I mean we are coming up on two hours here and Catherine we are going to be doing at least another two three four podcasts together because there's so many topics to jump into I really wanted to talk about your course so that um you know we can see if we can help promote it and get you know even more people signed up for it and for people to understand how important it is to have this knowledge you know you can have a knowledge about nutrition you can have knowledge about how your body works but you know having a plan that you can use throughout your life as well because mm -hmm. you might not be pregnant right now but you might be pregnant find yourself pregnant in two years you might not have a disease right now but you might find that yourself or somebody else has a disease in six months an illness in six months and so this knowledge, you're going to be carrying it through for the rest of your life as you age, 
as you build your family, as you have grandkids and so on. So um, it's so important. Other topics I want to discuss with you in the future for sure is the potassium sodium topic and mm-hmm. how important what it, I mean, that in itself is a, a whole entire conversation. And then also just getting into the different aspects of the um, dietary healing as well, and which align with the Gerson therapy as well. Um, so people understand the science around it a lot better. And because you draw such great analogies, it's, it's going to be really fun to have you on the show for our listeners, for sure. Um, so one piece that we talked about earlier, um, and we can use this to wrap up, But let's talk about this piece about, you had talked about the trans theoretical model of change. You talked about, um, you know, what makes people ready to make change. And I think that is by far one of the most important pieces that I've always been fascinated as well with my clients. Like what allows one person, you know, the same individual who doesn't want to take action six months ago or a year ago, what allows them to take action today? It's been very interesting because doing the research and with the program um, down in the south of Brisbane, we've been watching who is it that takes the challenge and what is it that's needed for people to actually say, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to go forward. And the way I would describe it is in terms of flow. So flow happens when there's a certain amount of heat or stimulus And so what you have, what what I've noticed is for different people, it's different types of stimulus. So for some people, if there's too much stimulus or too much stress involved, you get too much heat and it creates friction so the journey doesn't happen. With other people, if you remove the stress, let's say, it can actually make them go cold or go off the boil. So there's no point. So we're looking at it in terms of a heat map of in and in the in different people, some people, what we discovered, what their core needs were, were for space and communication. So if a person didn't have enough space in their life in order to make the program a reality, it wouldn't happen. So it's not anything to do with oh, people need educating more. It's a question of how you unpack what your barriers are and for each individual, how you overcome those barriers. So for for example, for a lot of people, they can't say no. So they're always putting other people first. Why is it that they're doing that? Or is it that they have greater, what, what are their needs? And then how can we unpack those needs to make sure that they're also putting themselves first so this is where they're looking at solutions that are within scope so there's never anything wrong with people not looking at it from that point of view what's wrong with me that I can't do it why do I self-doubt why do I um, procrastinate why is it so what is it that will make the journey possible for all those different types of people And it's different types of stimulus or different types of conditions. So some people may need, so for example, we were mapping of people during the COVID-19 thing. And for some people, I would have thought that it would have given them time to put their routine into place. They would have moved forward because they would have had less stress. All right, and I was thinking, great, we're going to get some fantastic statements about people moving forward. So it's like, how has COVID-19 helped you move forward? For some people, it did. But for other people, with the loss of their routine, they gave up. So some people need structure and a very defined purpose. So what we discovered was now that they know that, they say, that's why I've always failed is when things change in my life and I lose my routine, I said, so you need to understand that and be ready to put in a new routine straight away to feel safe. So those people need a lot of, there was one lady who absolutely needed to go into work. She needed that communication with people in order to fuel her journey. For other people, they needed space, so they they actually thrived. 
in that situation of lockdown because they got the space that they needed to make a difference. There was one lady where we found the key to her journey, because we're looking at a key, what will unlock it? With the key to her journey was simply by getting family support. So she was a person who couldn't accept help, right? So she felt she had to do everything. So she wasn't asking for support. And if her husband said, how can I help? She'd say, I'll leave it, I'll do it myself, it's quicker. Which of course meant that she never did her own journey. She was doing everybody else's journey. She was prepared to make that incremental request change, which was, well, actually, could you do this or can we structure it in such a way so that we have time together at the weekend time the weekends are free for me to enjoy my family and you rather than catch up mode of everything I haven't done during the week because I'm working full time so it's those practical things it's to do with your circumstances it's not to do with how bad your health is it's to do with the circumstances in your life that stand in your way. And we've always focused on things like non-affordability, non-accessibility, all those things. What I found in the research, it's the circumstances where we are our own worst enemy. And when we look at that, what's stopping you? Because I thought the model was wrong when I first went in. It was like I was with a group of people and they say, no, there's nothing stopping me. I can afford this. I've got a good doctor, you know, everything's in place. And I was thinking, well, why aren't, why are you where you are? Why aren't you further on your journey? So I thought, I know, we'll look at, even if I could change certain things, would I? And so we were able to unpack all the things that they felt were stopping them from moving forward. And I got my criteria from that for measuring change. So that's, that's, what we, that's what we found. Which I just think is so brilliant because as you we were speaking, there were so many pieces that resonated, resonated with, you know, my own self. And, you know, sometimes other people can see us more, I think, truly than we can often see ourselves. You know, we, we often blind ourselves by bias and, and all these things. And my husband is always pointing it out to me. And even my kids now have arrived at the place where they know if I ask them to do something, if they just wait two seconds, I'm going to get up and do it myself. So they're now like, I'm like, why aren't you getting up to help me? And they're like, cause mom, you always just go do it yourself. And mm-hmm. I am one of those people that need to take a moment, take a breath, make a plan, ask someone, pause, let them contribute. And then I realize, oh my gosh, that's so much easier sometimes if I just delegate or ask somebody else to do it. There was also the piece that I learned during COVID as well about myself. And I just love that question, you know, um, what is the key to your journey? And I know the key to my journey, and literally I will be taking a 7,000 kilometer journey by running and biking across Canada. But um what are the keys to my journey to moving my body? Because, you know, a lot of my podcast listeners know I've talked about this before, but I can sit behind my desk at my computer for hours on end. That's the researcher in me. So moving my body over the last, you know, since really I learned about the Gerson therapy has been, you know, since having three kids, it's been very challenging because I love my work. I'm like so driven by it. It's my purpose. I just, you know, I I literally could do this 24 hours a day. And I realized for me during COVID that what allows me to do things that I don't normally want to do or that I might find hard is I love doing it with other people. So to start running and biking, I put a call out on Facebook and I said, I need an accountability partner. I need someone to call me the night before. We wake up at six o'clock in the morning. I meet you at a certain place. We run together and it has been the best thing. Now I'm like addicted to moving my body. I love it so much, but I do need to do it with other people. Whereas somebody else might need to be alone. That's right. And that's where we talk about when people find their own solutions, but they have to be solutions that are within scope. Yeah. <clears throat> Rather than somebody saying, you should do this, the person is saying, I can see I really need to do that. How can I make it possible for me? I like that. Yeah, and you can, 
use that in so many areas of your life. It doesn't just have to be around, you know, body health. It could be around environmental health. Like what role do you want to have in bettering the planet or financial health or your own relationship with your partner or your children? Yeah. It's, it's, very it's, the really small, it's the small incremental things because most people don't jump to the solution. They think the solution is out of scope. I can never change that. But if you say, what would it, where would you like to be at the very least? So you describe the situation and what do you think would get you there? And that's the solution. So if I just did that or if I just asked for that, then I would reach that point. And so it's making that small first step. And when you then discover the possibilities, it then opens and it accelerates the journey. So that's what we found is the people who are prepared to make the incremental steps were the ones that went the furthest. But for many people, it's an all or nothing. Won't work. It's out of scope. It can never happen. It's step by step. Yeah. And I've seen that for, for clients as well. You know, you explain all the, you know, four components. I've added a few more components, uh, more around mind and spirit, which are also part of the Gerson therapy as well. But, you know, outside of the juicing, the food, the liver detoxification and any additional herbs or supplements that you might need. But some people do look at that and they feel very overwhelmed by that. And it's why I designed our five week program, which was Week one, let's look at food. Let's just even just discuss food. And maybe you might even make a few changes around food. And then week two was like, what if we added one to three juices a day? What would that look like? Could you do that? And then week three was, okay, like let's look at your nutritional deficiencies, the ones that truly cannot get replaced via the food alone and the juicing alone. So the supplementation and then, or week three is detoxification and week four is supplementation. And then week five is, can we actually bring all this together? And yeah, and for people who don't have, you know, who have five weeks, people who are not, you know, don't have a life-threatening illness where that five weeks could delay their healing too much, then it's, you can play in that and just learn. Yeah. Over those five weeks, you know, what are those things that you need that you could take? What are those steps you could take to get yourself there to that end goal that you set for yourself? Oh, Catherine, this has been wonderful chatting with you. I do feel like I'm almost in the same room as you. And one day I hope to be in the same room as you and we can be having a juice together or a cup of tea. Well, let's How- make it happen. Let's make it happen. We'll sign up for your course. Yes, I am happy to go to Australia 100%. When the borders open and things settle down a bit, I would love to do that. And you are always more than welcome to come up to Whistler and Pemberton where we live as well. Right. So how do people sign up for your course, Catherine? Um, they can just go to the, uh, the website above and just Perfect. go to Ready Reckoner and they can sign up from there. Um, if people want to... I don't have my consultations on there because we did talk about that. Uh, they can just go to, to my other website, which is katherinealexander.com.au if they want a consultation. But that's the website, healthcommons.global, for the Ready Reckoner course. And that, if people aren't sure, they can always email me from that website to find out more. But there's lots of information on there. Okay, that is perfect. And I highly recommend that if anyone out there is, you know, has a chronic issue, and a lot of people don't realize that the symptoms they have are actually chronic conditions. So I'll maybe just rattle off a few of them. Um, If you have rectal bleeding and hemorrhoids, if you have PMS, or if you have irregular periods, or um, your menstrual cycle is not what you think it should be, if you suffer from migraines, or headaches repetitively, if you, your eyesight is going, macular degeneration, I I know you've worked with people with macular degeneration, I have as well. Um, If you have, of course, the leading chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, infertility, any type of autoimmune disorder, cancer. I mean, 
anything that you might have, if you have rashes all over your body, or even just in a little spot on your body, you know, really consider booking an appointment with Catherine because she spends so much time going through your records before you even meet with her. Then she's going to walk you through what you need to do. And then you can always follow up with her afterwards. And, you know, as you've gained from this interview, you can see how caring she is, how nice she is. Um, she's just as nice as your nice oncologist and your nice, you know, medical practitioner that's out there. So I highly recommend that you book an appointment now. Start to treat any of those symptoms now. Don't wait until the prognosis is bad. Um, do it now because everything you learn will benefit your family. Your family will be able to do so many of the things that you learn from Catherine in your own personal consult as well. So it'll just be good for you, your family, and obviously your greater community as well. Would you agree, Catherine? That's a wonderful um, advertisement, <laughs> Nicolette, but yes, it will. It's the act, act sooner rather than later because it's yeah. much easier to do it right at the beginning. Less painful and less costly and then you maintain it for the rest of your life. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. So we'll have all the links in the show notes below so that everybody can just click the link, sign up for the course or book a consult, or just jump onto Catherine's website and lots of wonderful resources there for you to learn. So thank you, Catherine, for being on our Eat Real to Heal show. It's been a pleasure and we're going to have to do this again. We will. Thank you very much, Nicolette. <laughs> wonderful. Isn't Catherine Alexander just a wealth of knowledge? She is amazing. And I really, you know, aside from Dr. Colin Campbell and Udo as Erasmus, who we just had on our show um, recently, I mean, she's been doing this work for 35 years. She is well-versed in the sciences. She is well-versed on, you know, bedside manner and working alongside patients and understanding their needs to implement, um, to implementing food as medicine. So, you know, she's really somebody that you want to work alongside um, while you can, because, you know, I always say, and you've heard me say this before, but the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. So truly the best time to have started to eat well and to really implement nutritional therapy and nutritional programs as medicine for the reversal of your health or prevention of disease, it really was 20 years ago. Not five years ago, not two years ago, not today. It was really 20 years ago. But if you haven't done it, then you can still do it now. And there's no better time to get started than today. So sign up for Catherine's program, The Ready Reckoner, through her Health Commons website. Links are below. Sign up, join me, because I'm going to be taking the program as well. Because, you know, we only know what we know, and it's so important to keep learning. It's so important to gather resources and to really test and see what works. Because if you just hand over everything to your healthcare professional, I can guarantee you for the most part, most of them will just prescribe the medication, prescribe the surgery, and just give you the, the calm and you're going to have to live with this. But if you decide to take your health into your own hands and you advocate for yourself, which is exactly what Catherine is teaching, well, that is what sets you apart from the people who live with their diseases and die with their diseases versus the people who actually reverse their diseases and reclaim their lives. So sign up for Catherine's course. Also, you know, if you don't want to do that just yet, but you just want to dip your toes into nutritional healing, you, so you can also buy our book. Um, it's our Eat Real to Heal book. It's still a number one bestseller on Amazon. We have helped so many people turn their lives around through that book. So get a copy of yours. I've learned everything from Catherine. So go straight to the source, I'm telling you. But if it's, you know, out of your price range and you just want to start small right now, get a copy of our book. If you're ready to jump into a consult, you can jump into a consult with myself and I can walk you through what the plan is to reversing your health. You can do that at our website or you can sign up for a consult with Catherine Alexander. Either way, we tend to tag team because I do not prescribe. I do not diagnose, but that's what Catherine does. And then where I come in is I hold your hand through implementing your treatment program. 
So just want to give a few shout outs as well before I wrap up this show today. And that is to Blend It For You. Blend It For You makes incredible smoothie pucks or packs in these beautiful compostable packaging um, containers. I'm going to be using them throughout my training. I am using them. They're amazing. They make a world of difference in my training. I've noticed I have more energy. They sustain me and they're packed full of nutrients. So Blend It For You has created an incredible pack just for the Green Mustache, our collection of plant-based whole food restaurants, as well as for me for our 22 Million Strong Tour. So a big shout out to Blended For You. Love that you created this product for us. You can order your products in bulk and have them shipped directly to you. So jump onto their website and put in your order today. And a portion of the proceeds from the sale of those um, packaged amazing smoothie pucks will go directly to the 22 million strong campaign. Also want to give a shout out to Mountain Life Media and to Todd Lawson and his team for sharing our stories about the 22 million tour and for their PR and media coverage as well. So excited uh, to have them come on board as our sponsor. So thanks everyone for listening to our this episode of the Eat Real to Heal show and our podcast in general. Stay tuned for next week's show. We're always so excited to bring these incredible guests that we have to you. And in the meantime, you know what to do. Share this podcast with everyone you know, and eat well so that you can do well. Bye for now.